introduction. Just to make sure you see the slides. Yes, yes, we do. Okay. So the title of my talk is, as you see, it's quantization of eight polynomials for knots and quiggles. And my talk will be essentially or mostly devoted to those eight polynomials. I thought it would be more pedagogical in a sense. So I will review some things that have been going on in this area for uh, some time or last few years. Uh, maybe some of you are aware of all that. Uh, so if I'm speaking too slow or something too obvious, you can, of course, let me know. And in fact, these things also make contact with uh, the main topic of this series, both topological recursion and integrability. I will not focus that much on these aspects, but they will provide important motivation for everything I, I say. So that's why I, uh, in a sense, decided to talk about uh, this A polynomials. And uh, well, here you see some pictures. Of course, on the left, there is a knot. On the right, there is a quiver. I will explain more details uh, in the talk and explain how uh, these objects are supposed to relate to topological recursion, for example. So here is the plan. I will start with explaining the idea what is supposed to be a quantization of algebraic curves. Then I will introduce some necessary background on not invariants uh, and explain how these eight polynomials arise, what, what they are. Uh, then I will discuss uh, some other aspects where they appear in particular in the counting of PPS states. Uh, and one uh, like novel uh, discovery in this context is the knots quivers correspondence, so the relation between knots and quivers, which enables to characterize this BPS states uh, like more accurately. And yeah, I will explain some details. This is also in a way related to a polynomials. And then the end, I will introduce a family of a polynomials, which we call quiver a polynomials. And also, we yeah, mentioned the U properties and uh, relations to topological recursion. So that's the plan. And yeah, the first uh, the first remark is about quantization of algebraic curves. I will be quite brief. Uh, so I mean, in most of the talk, I will skip various technical details. So some of you may be maybe unhappy that there are not too much details but uh, yeah, on the other hand my aim is to give like an overview and broader picture rather than focus on various technical aspects so uh, well probably we all know this uh, but as a starting slide is uh, a very brief reminder that the topological recursion is some uh, device which assigns various invariants to algebraic curves, uh, either symplectic invariants or multi-differentials. So I have uh, this in mind uh, in the whole talk, but uh, the phenomenon I am mostly interested in is not uh, to focus on this invariant that I just mentioned, but on the so-called quantum version of algebraic curves uh, in question. So in various situations, it happens that an algebraic curve is, uh, one may say, a symbol or a classical limit of some differential or difference operator. Uh, and this classical, as we call it, classical algebraic curve arises in the limit of uh, some parameter, typically noted h bar being zero. So on the left in this equation, we have some operator a hat acting on some, uh, let's say, wave function, and I am annihilating it. When h bar goes to zero, this operator becomes uh, just algebraic curve. And the arguments here, x hat and y hat are, of course, uh, operator arguments, which in this limit become just commuting variables. So the general idea is that topological recursion allows to reconstruct such quantum curves from the classical limit. So it appears that it is possible to reverse the arrow in this upper frame and go from the classical curve to, uh, to this quantum operator. 
and some on applications of this process appear in knot theory and also topological string theory. So I have to, uh, okay. I have to change my, how I view the slides because we are, uh, some of the slides are covered uh, in my mind. Okay, sorry. So uh, these eight polynomials, which I will discuss in what follows, provide an interesting ground uh, for this phenomena of getting quantum curve from the classical one. And uh, <clears throat> this wave function that appeared in the, in the previous slide can be also thought of as an analog of a quantity which appears in matrix models. So in a sense, matrix, mo matrix models provide also a motivation for all this activity. Namely, in the matrix model context, it is uh, useful to introduce the following notion of wave function, which is the expectation value of the determinant of uh, x minus m. I wrote here where m would be the matrix or ensemble of matrices that we integrate over. And uh, typically, this wave function has the following asymptotic expansion. This is some series in h bar. In matrix model, this h bar is proportional to an inverse, or this is just the inverse size of, of the matrices in question. So uh, by manipulating this expression, I skip details here, but it can be shown that this coefficients sk in this expansion can be expressed by the small two differentials, which arise from the topological recursion procedure in case this recursion is considered uh, in the matrix model context. <clears throat> and uh, one may show, at least under certain assumptions, that such a wave function is annihilated by the operator, which is a quantum version of the spectral curve. So in this way, one can indeed reconstruct this quantum curve, this operator that analyzes the wave function, at least order by order in the expansion in this H bar. And uh, this is the idea which also we want to apply in the context of A polynomials. Namely, these A polynomials, which, which will appear in other contexts in my talk and don't come from matrix models necessarily, are still supposed to give rise to some operators whose form can be reconstructed by, uh, by the, uh, this machinery of topological recursion. And here is a list of papers where this idea was uh, taken into account or considered. Of course, the list is not exhaustive. Uh, I include papers in this context and also some papers of myself, which I will talk about in what follows. So uh, one of the first, or maybe the first idea in the context of apolynomials of using this, uh, this viewpoint was discussed by Hiroyuki, Fuji and Robert Digraph. Uh, and later they also wrote the second paper with Masahide Manabe, where they applied topological recursion, uh, in particular in the second paper. They uh, applied the topological recursion to a polynomials for nodes. Uh, sometime later, there was a paper where similar construction was considered in case of torus nodes. This is one special family of nodes. In that context, topological recursion was also used. It was not used, in fact, uh, the, uh, it was not applied for the A polynomial, but for some other curve, but uh, here the idea is quite similar. And also in similar time, I had a paper with Sergey where we discussed some features of this, uh, of this idea as well. Later on, there was a work by Gaetan Boro and uh, Bertrand Einart where they uh, discussed this quantization uh, idea or the way of obtaining uh, asymptotics of uh, various invariants uh, of nodes uh, in more detail. 
And yet another work which I will hopefully still discuss uh, in my talk is to apply this idea in the context of uh, so-called quiver A polynomials. So this is a bit different family of algebraic curves. And uh, with my collaborators, we had a paper uh, about uh, that quite recently. So I hope to, uh, to come to, to these developments as well. So uh, to continue, I will start with introducing this A polynomials first of all in this context of not invariance. And uh, to do that, I will very briefly uh, start with Jones polynomial. I suppose that most of you know what Jones polynomial is, so I don't want to give too many details, but just to maybe remind you, or in case you have not worked with that invariance, let me just say a few words. That Jones polynomial is a polynomial defined by the so-called scale relation, which you see in this uh, in this slide. In this slide, this Jones polynomial is denoted by V, and the, its argument is T. So this is a polynomial in one variable. In the rest of the talk, in fact, I will use different notation. But well, sometimes it's good to use different notations, which people use. So maybe we can get used to that in a sense as well. So here the idea is that we look at a projection of a node. We look at all crossings in these projections. And then we uh, consider a given crossing or the crossing where we reverse this trend, which is going upper or lower. And we also consider uh, the situation where this crossing is replaced by two parallel strands, as you see in, in this three arguments. And then the statement is that if we have this free diagrams uh, or corresponding uh, nodes, then they Jones polynomials are related by, by this equation. So in some way, this is a recursion relation. If you have some node diagram, you can play with it uh, and uh, replace all the crossings by, uh, by the other ones and so on. If you do this uh, long enough that at the end, you are able to reconstruct the Jones polynomial. And of course, you need some initial conditions which can be chosen in different ways. Uh, one possibility is such that the trivial knot has Jones polynomial equal to one. And if you take a trivial knot and then independently any other knot, then Jones polynomial of, uh, of this, uh, in fact, link is given by Jones polynomial of the knot times this factor, which you see in the equation in the bottom, square root of t, uh, well, minus square root of t and minus uh, inverse square root of t. So one simple exercise is to compute this Jones polynomial for the Hopf link, which is uh, a link made of two unknots, which are uh, interlaced, in fact. So you see immediately that if you consider, uh, here I focus on this bottom, on the top crossing, if you replace it by the other type of crossing, then you get two unlinked unknots. Or if you smooth it, then you get the unknot. And now if you use uh, the second equation from the previous slide, that the Jones polynomial of the unknot and something else is the Jones polynomial of the unknot by that factor, you get uh, one piece of this equation. On the other hand, this unknot on the right hand side being just unknot has Jones polynomial one. So if you use this information and plug back to this initial kind of relation, then you get Jones polynomial for, for the hop flick in, in this normalization that I discussed. And another exercise is to compute it for the trefoil. So uh, also if you either smooth or replace one crossing, here I consider this crossing on the left by another one, then if you smooth it, then you get hop flick. If you replace it by another crossing, you get the trivial knot. And again, if you plug the results that we already had, you get the Jones polynomial for the for the uh, trefoil knot. And uh, well, trefoil knot is the one which you see here in the top uh, picture, uh, in case you don't work with knots uh, that often. So this is, of course, uh, very well known for almost 40 years now. Jones uh, discovered this polynomial in 1984. Uh, and just as a warm-up, I wanted to, to, to remind you very briefly how this is defined. 
but of course, in what follows, I will not work with this kind of relations. In fact, in practice, they are not so easy to work with. What I will have in mind is rather the picture that Witten developed, uh, well, a few years after Jones, which is the statement that this type of not invariance can be understood as uh, observables in turn Simon's theory. So I suppose you also know uh, this quite well. To get such an observable, one has to consider the Wilson loop. And then the statement is that expectation value of the Wilson loop uh, or the trace in some representation R of exponent of the integral of uh, this gauge connection A along a path which is a given knot gives us the polynomial, which is either Jones polynomial, in case we consider Tron Simon's theory with SU2 gauge group, or some more general polynomial, in particular, if we consider SUN gauge group, then we get Humphrey polynomial, which is a polynomial in two variables. I will call them in what follows A and Q. So in fact, this variable T I had in the previous uh, slide, in what follows, I will call Q. And A in this context is defined as Q to the power N. So the non-trivial, very non-trivial statement is that this integral in turn Simon's theory gives a polynomial with integral coefficients, A and Q. So, uh, also, what is crucial for me is that I will consider typically colored polynomials. And by colored, I mean that I consider non-trivial representations R. Sometimes this original Jones polynomial or Humphrey polynomials are called uncolored ones, and they correspond to the fundamental representation. And in fact, most often in what follows, I will focus on symmetric representations, which are labeled by YAG diagrams, uh, which are made of just one row of some length n. OK, so I mentioned all that because uh, now I can tell you what is a polynomial. But instead of giving the proper mathematical definition, let me first tell you some properties it has, because they will be more uh, probably important for, for us. And uh, in some cases, they are proven. In some cases, they are just conjectural. And uh, one of uh, them has uh, is related to so-called volume conjecture. And here, the statement is that the A polynomial, this is an algebraic curve given by this equation, A of x, y being 0. The statement is that it encodes asymptotics of color Jones polynomials. So in this frame on the left, I have Jones polynomial, like the one from the previous slide. Uh, let us think of it as just some expectation value in terms of Simon's theory for, for SU2 gauge group. And then for the symmetric representation labeled by the Young diagram, which is just one row with R boxes. So then the statement is that if we take the limit where this Q approaches one, and uh, we denote q to power r by x and consider the limit where this x is fixed, which means taking large r, and at the same time h bar going to 0, then uh, the, this color Jones polynomial has the following expansion, where the leading term as 0 is obtained by making an integral uh, of log y dx divided by x, where y and x satisfy this equation divided by a polynomial. So in this sense, this a polynomial encodes the asymptotics of color Jones polynomials. So this is one way to formulate this volume conjecture that I mentioned. And then uh, coming back to this idea I presented in the very beginning, the statement, uh, well, this quantization statement is that this subleading corrections S1, S2, and so on can be reconstructed by using topological recursion uh, applied to this uh, underlying uh, a polynomial curve. So 
uh, well, the statement about S0 is uh, known and postulated much time earlier. And then uh, the relation to topological recursion is uh, more uh, modern, so to say. So this is how the same polynomial makes contact with, uh, with, uh, with this idea of quantization. And uh, furthermore, there is a if, uh, quantum version of this operator A hat, which imposes recursion relations for, for those colored Jones polynomials. So these recursion relations can be concisely encoded uh, in this equation in this well middle frame now. And uh, also people use different notations. So just to remind about that, instead of writing x hat and y hat, which in fact I will use for uh, some other purpose, here I write m and l or m hat and l hat, which are operators which respectively either multiply the scholar Jones JR by Q to power R or shift the index R plus one. And in this case, uh, you can easily check that they satisfy this, uh, this uh, commutation relation that L hat M hat is equal to Q times M hat L hat. So uh, again, the, the question is how to construct such A hat. And in fact, it is proven that such a hat exists. Uh, in particular, Stavros Garofalidis uh, has papers when he proves that such an object exists. However, it is not uh, obvious to determine it uh, explicitly. And uh, also, Piotr, this, may I yes. ask one question? Yeah. It's maybe a little bit off topic, but is it crucial that GRs are the polynomials or not the rational functions? I mean, when you prove that this uh, properties for M and L gives you the right commutation relation. Is it crucial that J R? Are polynomials here, yeah. Well, I'm not sure what crucial means because in this case of nodes, they, they just are, it can be proven. Mm -hmm. But more generally, you you can consider wave functions which are not polynomials, which are still annihilated by uh, some finite uh, operators, finite in the sense that this a hat, I should stress that this a hat itself is also uh, just a polynomial. I mean that this is a polynomial in Q, M hat and L hat, but it has finite number of terms. Mm -hmm. So I think one can cook up examples where whatever way function you have is not necessarily a polynomial. I'm not sure if it answers your question. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, maybe, uh, well, it's just, you know, some uh, side remark or, you know, naive observation, but uh, with polynomials, of course, uh, what is important is that uh, basically shifting the polynomials uh, well, we get polynomial or we get, uh, yes. Shifting? Uh, yes, uh, because it's most of these uh, quantum operators are either multiplication or shift by, by, by schema. Yes. yes. And polynomials, of course, so it, it, they remain in the class of polynomials. And if we are in, uh, if we are considering rational function, then shift, of course, will destroy the structure. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, 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 Piotr, for this uh, interruption, so um, yes, please. So here I should stress also one very important thing. In fact, I haven't typed it properly, but it is quite non-trivial that we are talking, in fact, about curves. This A polynomials, which I consider here, are, are curves in C star times C star. And also this dependence on H bar is encoded in Q. And this is quite non-trivial that this A hat is just a polynomial in Q, not in H bar. So in fact, this application of topological recursion has like 
at least two instances. One is where we consider. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Einstein seminar. Andre, Andre, mute yourself, please. We hear you. So uh, you can consider oh, either. Yeah. You can consider plane curves in C times C, and then possibly A hat polynomials, which are polynomials in H bar. But in the context of the same polynomials for knots, I, the dependence in H bar is captured just by Q. And this is quite non-trivial because if you think of reconstructing this a polynomials by topological recursion, for example, then you of course reconstruct it order by order in H bar. And uh, in this uh, context, you would obtain some like infinite series of connections in, in H bar to A hat and also those uh, like JR uh, in this context. So this is quite a non-trivial statement that this uh, infinite series of uh, in H bar, in fact, is a finite polynomial in Q. And it is also a question which I'm not sure uh, if it is fully understood why, for example, topological recursion uh, should provide such a finite polynomial in Q, even though in principle it uh, produces some expansion in, in H bar. So this is one remark uh, yeah, which I wanted to add. And uh, again, uh, the the, uh, the motivation here is to reconstruct this a hat from from this classical curve a itself. So let me also mention that this a polynomials uh, in this context of John Simon's theory can be uh, interpreted as the moduli space of flat connections for SL2C, John Simon's, uh, the time John Simon's theory with SL2C gauge group. And this interpretation is very close to the original definition of a polynomial, which I also have not typed, but essentially this a polynomial is a character variety. Uh, well, SL2C character variety. So what you have to consider are representations of the fundamental group of a not complement uh, in SL2C. And then it turns out that these representations uh, cannot be arbitrary. There is some moduli space of them, which is parameterized by points on such an algebraic curve. But uh, as I mentioned, I will not use this original definition that much. Let me just also mention uh, one uh, other interpretation, which also appears in some physical context, in particular in so-called 3D, 3D duality, studied in uh, recent years, that this moduli, this uh, A polynomial can be also interpreted as the moduli space of vacia of certain supersymmetric, and equal to supersymmetric three-dimensional theory, which uh, in appropriate way is dual to to, to the not complement. So, uh, okay, this is these are a few properties of these A polynomials. And now let me show you maybe some example just to see uh, how things work in practice. So, for trefoil, which already I uh, showed you the picture of trefoil earlier. This A polynomial takes the following form. One important uh, property of A polynomial is that it always has the factor L minus one. Uh, let me stress when we consider this A polynomials uh, like uh, in the context of turn Simons with SU2 gauge group or in the context of, uh, uh, of Jones polynomials. So uh, for trefoil, not this algebraic curve looks like this. And then this A hat polynomial uh, imposes recursion relations for those colored zones. So these recursion relations are given below. You see that we have a uh, recursion relation which involves three terms, J with index R minus one, R and R plus one. And there are some coefficients. These coefficients are rational functions in Q and Q to power R. 
if you are concerned that these are rational functions, you can in fact multiply everything by these denominators and we will have uh, equation in uh, whose coefficients will be just uh, polynomials. And you can also easily check that if you take this limit that I mentioned before, that Q goes to one and Q to R is fixed, then uh, this quantum relation will reduce to uh, this classical A polynomial given above. So that's uh, one example how this object uh, behaves. And also in what follows, in fact, I will consider these A polynomials in broader context. So you might think of the, them as generalized A polynomials. And that's just an important remark because often when I think these days, when people say A polynomials, they quite often have in mind this generalized A polynomials rather than the original one. So again, uh, let me stress that this original A polynomial has to do, or you can uh, relate it to Chern Simon's theory with SU2 or, or SL2C gauge group. And then one obvious modification is to consider Trans Simon's theory with uh, SU n gauge group, or to go from Jones polynomials to Homfy polynomials. In that case, you can consider similar algebraic curve, which encodes asymptotics of colored Jones polynomials. As far as I recall, in that case, uh, it is not uh, possible to give this interpretation of character variety. However, there is some object which is called augmentation polynomial, also considered in this not theory context, which, uh, which is related to the generalized say, polynomial in a sense that it can be shown that it encodes asymptotics of colored Jones, oh, sorry, of colored Humphrey polynomials in this case. So in fact, if you consider this asymptotics, uh, important uh, aspect is that you keep A, this variable A fixed, and you also take Q to one and this color variable to, to infinity. So this is one modification or generalization on the left, in this left frame. Another possibility is to consider so-called homological deformation or the refined version or, of a polynomial, which then depends on extra variable t. So this homological deformation has to do with so-called homological not invariance. I don't want to go into details. For those of you who know that, then it should be familiar. If you are not familiar, then let me just say that there is some natural uh, deformation uh, of this not polynomials. And uh, I mean, there is natural deformation of Jones or Humphrey polynomials, which involves one extra parameter, one extra variable. And then this also uh, has the counterpart on the level of A polynomials. And in fact, these two deformations can be combined together. In that case, we obtain some object which is called super A polynomial. Here I gave the reference because this is something we found with Hiroyuki Fuji and Sergei Yukov, in fact, already like 10 years ago, so the time uh, is quite fast. But there is, uh, anyway, such class of uh, A polynomials which depend on two variables. I will not talk that much about the student formation in the rest of the talk, but I will, in most cases, I will focus on this A deformation. So that's why yeah, I wanted to. Uh, to, to mention that these deformations uh, exist and are constant. And also talking about this A deformation, at some point certain, yet another limit of A polynomials uh, will be important for us, which, are, which we call extremal A polynomials. I will mention what they are uh, sometime later, but essentially they have something to do with looking at the extremal powers of this variable A and forgetting the rest of the information. Yeah, so this is the landscape of objects which I will focus on in uh, the rest of the, or most of the rest of the talk. And again, just to give you yet another example, now a bit more general, not in case of Jones, but in case, in fact, of both these deformations, A and T, here is the formula for colored 
so-called super polynomial, where I have both variables a and t, then such an object is called super polynomial. It shouldn't be confused with super a polynomials. So the super a polynomial is a deformation you may think of it as a generalization or deformation of Humphrey polynomial. If you set t to be equal to minus one, then this formula, this quantity that is written here, will reduce to colored Humphrey polynomial. So here n denotes the color, this is the subscript n denotes the color. And in fact, for Trefoil you node, know, the super polynomial, so also colored Humphrey polynomial can be explicitly determined as you see. And in the table, you have the first few explicit formulas for those colored polynomials. The, it is maybe also not immediate that this expression given by this summation reduces to polynomials because there is some Kupok hammer in the denominator. So it is not completely obvious that uh, everything cancels, but uh, it indeed does. And also one important feature of those super polynomials is that they have integer coefficients, which are also positive. So as you see, all this uh, quantities in this table have uh, positive coefficients everywhere are plus signs, not minus signs, even though these cupo hammers in this general formula, of course, involve minus signs. So this is also quite a non-trivial statement that we get on the plus signs here. But of course, when you go to colored Humphrey polynomials, meaning that you replace T, I mean, set T to be equal minus one, then we will get uh, various uh, minus signs in these expressions. So this is colored polynomial, and then you can also check that this is annihilated by the operator yeah, given below uh, the table. So uh, this operator is of the third of the second order in y hat, and the coefficients a zero, a one, a two are given below. And also we might multiply everything by denominators to get just polynomial expressions. So somehow for convenience, I wrote and I wrote it uh, with denominators. So uh, again, uh, one statement is that in fact, not just this unrefined A hat operators, but even with T deformation, it might be possible to reconstruct them starting from this uh, classical counterparts. If you take the limit, this classical limit in this case, then this A hat operator reduces to the following algebraic curve. So again, we think of this as algebraic curve in X and Y, but in this case, the, the coefficients are functions of A and T. And if you set T to minus one and A to be one, then this object will reduce to, to A polynomial the original a polynomial relevant for for the SU to turn Simon's theory. So this object maybe it's not immediate, but it will reduce to the one which I had on the top of this slide, possibly up to some factors which are in a sense quite simple and uh, can be ignored. So this M and L, in, uh, sorry, this M and L in this slide, they would correspond to X and Y in this slide. All right, and then uh, Piotr, final uh, one reformulation. Second. A polynomials. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, no, no. That's precisely what I wanted to mention. That actually, this x and y are not just uh, standard Darbu. It's uh, exponentiated, so to speak. I think Darbu coordinates, right? right? Yeah, yeah. This I mentioned indeed. I mentioned before. X and Y are in C star, by which I mean that you can think of them as being exponents of some U and V. If U and V satisfy ordinary commutation relations, I mean the commutator of U and V is H bar, then uh, X and Y, which are exponents of U and V, satisfy this commutation relation, which you see on the right now in the bottom. This Y hat X hat is equal to Q X hat Y hat. So they are exponentiated. That's very, very 
and important, of course. And uh, let me stress that one has to be very careful in using this X and Y variables because they are used somehow interchangeably in, in literature. So in fact, to be more uh, conservative, one should use M hat and L hat in the context, or just M and L in the context of this original A polynomial, which I discussed so far. However, it is also uh, of advantage, and uh, this is what will play a role in the rest of my talk. It is also of advantage to use this, uh, to consider these dual A polynomials, which arise if instead of this colored polynomials, so this, let's say, colored conflict PR, if you consider a generating function of, of those. So this generating function, to have such a generating function, I need a new argument or some generating variable, which I'll call the X. And instead of considering P with index R, I consider the generating function P of X, which is the sum of all PR and each one weighted by uh, X to the power R. And then you can see that uh, how, uh, how this M hat and L hat operators act on, on this generating function. So what this M hat does, it essentially multiplies the argument of P, so this X by Q. And what L hat does, it multiplies the P by X inverse. So for that reason, it is useful to, now I introduce another set of uh, operators, which I call X and X hat and Y hat. These are those on the right hand side, such that X hat is multiplying P of X by X and Y hat is multiplying the argument. I mean, this X in the argument uh, by Q. And then uh, I may consider a curve. This is what sorry, I mean. Sorry, I mean. What, what is the difference between Y hat and uh, M hat? Uh, well, in essence, they are all, almost identical. So M hat is multiplying the argument by Q. So M hat may be identified with Y hat. That's what I'm asking. X hat is like inverse L. So M hat and Y hat are really the same. Uh, yeah, in a sense, they are the same. But for me, it is. Uh, I want to distinguish them because I want to think of this X hat and, a and Y hat as acting on this generating series P of X. Uh, well, I maybe wouldn't need to, uh, to, uh, to use new notation, but in fact, uh, this new notation in what follows it is useful because uh, this X inverse would, uh, would be a bit cumbersome. Uh, Okay. Maybe I missed something earlier because I just tuned in, but maybe you defined M hat's action already on the coefficients PR. And yeah, yeah. M hat's and L hat's. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's crucial. Sure. In a sense, this is. Uh, they, in a sense, M, L, and X, Y act the same on generating functions, but uh, M, as such, M and L, they act on this PR. So that's what I yeah. mentioned before. So yeah, you see that. On in these equations on the left, m hat uh, m hat multiplies p r by q to power r. And l would you mind very much? I apologize for this because I tuned in late. But would you mind just scrolling back to the definition of m hat? And yeah, let me go back. Oh, I had it like here in the middle of this slide. M hat and l hat act on j r, or also this p r respectively by multiplying it by q to power r and shifting the index r. I see. And x hat and y hat, which I am introducing now, are supposed to act on, in principle, any function or, of course, some proper class of functions. But now I don't need to think about coefficients. I think just of x hat and y hat as either multiplying p by x or multiplying argument by, by q. Okay, thanks. So that's why I, in a sense, want to distinguish between them. But because of this relation, I mean, they act similarly on the generating function, then 
the, this dual A polynomial can be easily obtained from this previous A polynomial I had just by appropriate uh, identification of, uh, of the argument. So if I use replace M by Y inverse and L by X, then from A hat, I get this curly A. If you look carefully, I use different font here, this A hat, curly A hat, is some operator acting on, on P of X. No. And, well, you've interchanged the order. Yes, I should interchange the order. Yeah, so this A hat uh, is equal to this original, not curly. A hat, but in, with interchange order and with this uh, M inverse. So, so that's why this is how this is constructed. And I will need that in what follows. So this is why I, it, for now, it may seem just like strange change of notation, but uh, in a few moments, I, I will need that a bit more. So I will also stress, because this is what I will need in a moment, that this P of X in this context can be thought of as a special case of more general series. If I would consider all colored, not polynomials, colored by all possible representations PR, then uh, in some contexts it is useful to consider the following generating series PR multiplied by this trace R of some matrix V, which can be higher dimensional. However, if I take this V to be just one dimensional, so if I, instead of V take matrix, which is one by one and call it by X, then the sum over all representation, in fact, reduces to the sum over symmetric representations. And then I get this series, which I had above. So just uh, the sum over Young diagrams, which are made of one row. So I will need that uh, in a moment. Yeah, so I think these are uh, properties of this A polynomials. And by the way, sorry, I see, I haven't checked earlier, but now I see that there are some things I see on the chart, which are, uh, okay, maybe not something I need to uh, call, uh, to, or maybe we discuss that a bit, I don't know, but anyway. I don't need to comment on that, hopefully. So uh, in fact, this dual series, which I just introduced, it appears quite natural when we generalize all these considerations from just not invariance and trans-Hymon theory to topological strings and counting of uh, BPS states. And uh, this is related to the story uh, initiated also by Witten. So yeah, now, now I, will, I will make some interlude, but we will go back to the subjects which I just discussed uh, in a few minutes. So uh, now like almost 30 years ago, we can realize that uh, various turn Simons observables can be reinterpreted as observables in so-called A-model topological string theory which is some version of string theory uh, in, uh, which is defined uh, for some uh, three-dimensional, um, complex three-dimensional Calabiao manifold. In that case, the relevant Calabiao is just uh, cotangent bundle to S3, so-called different conifold. So one statement is that partition function of turn Simons on S3 is equal to partition function of this A-model topological string for this deformed conifold. And furthermore, this deformed conifold can be related to so-called uh, resolved conifold. The sound has gone off. Okay. Piotr, can you repeat because the sound uh, didn't work? A process called geometric transition in which we replace. Uh, oh. oh, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, so action for Turn Simons on S3 is turns out to be equal to 
partition function of a model topology class strings on the on this deformed conifold. And then, in particular, in string theory, quite often people consider processes called geometric transitions. So, for this deformed conifold, this is the process in which you shrink this S3 at first to just a singularity and then resolve it in some other way so that instead of the singularity, we get S2. So, this resulting manifold is called resolved conifold, and this can be thought of as the certain bundle over P1. And uh, then it can be shown that gromov witten invariants for this resulting result conifold can be resumed in such a way that they reproduce original observables of uh, turn simons theory. So that's uh, one statement. And another statement is that you can include, first of all, brains in all these systems, which in some way correspond to nodes. And moreover, the systems can be embedded in the full string theory. So instead of this free complex dimensional Calabi-Yau, uh, one can consider 10 dimensional string theory and super strings uh, in that context, or even in 11 dimensional M theory. And uh, so a simple way to complete this free complex uh, Calabi-Yau to 10 dimensions is to just consider this missing four dimensions as, as being R4. And, and we can also introduce extra brains in that system. Well, I should have mentioned before that uh, in this picture that I already very briefly characterized, I need to consider extra N brains, which are wrapping this as free. So in this process of geometric transition, in a sense, these brains give rise to, to this non-trivial S2. And moreover, to introduce nodes in the system, I need to introduce extra Lagrangian brain, such that this extra Lagrangian brain intersects this S3 along some, some nodes. So this is a construction proposed by Oguri, uh, or considered later also by Oguri and Vafa. So then this Lagrangian brain undergoes this geometric transition as well. And the statement is that uh, in this resulting resolved conifold, I still get uh, this brain, and I can consider open gromov witten invariants, which can also be resumed in this case to not invariants, which appear as observables in this turn Simons with, uh, with a given knot. So, uh, what I just described relates this gromov witten theory to turn Simons theory. And moreover, there is yet another viewpoint on all of that having to do with this extra four dimensions, namely, uh, whatever I have said so far can be interpreted in yet another way from the viewpoint of effective uh, theory, possibly some gauge theory in, uh, in this remaining four dimensions. And then it turns out that certain BPS states in the supersymmetric theory in four dimension have the properties which are uh, which are determined by uh, by this configuration of brains that we consider so in particular by the knot which we are interested in and well I don't want to go into too much details first of all because I don't have too much time and second uh, in a sense the story is known for already quite long. Uh, like two or more decades. So I will just uh, sh uh, show you the upshot of, of all that interpretation. And the upshot is that uh, it turns out that colored not polynomials, which appear as the in a sense building block of this of this brain configurations turn out to capture some integral invariants which have interpretation in this underlying theory in four space-time dimensions uh, and uh, well this property is quite uh, non-trivial 
So in the stop frame, uh, I have, uh, first of all, on the left hand side, the generating function, which one has to consider. And at first, Oguri and Wafa, and later also Oguri, Wafa, and Labastide and Marino realized that this generating function can be written in this form as on the right hand side as the exponent of some series. This series involves certain functions fr, which has which have certain structure given in this bottom frame. And the structure involves certain invariants, I mean, certain numbers which are integer. They, in the string theory or gauge theory interpretation, they have interpretation, they, I mean, they represent numbers of certain particles, BPS particles. So again, I'm not, I don't want to go into too much uh, details uh, how they arise, but for us, this is just an important statement that generating functions of this uh, color not polynomials have certain structure which involves the integer numbers. So also in the rest of the talk, I will I will focus on the properties of uh, of these uh, integralities. Uh, so just to have uh, at least a little idea how this works. You may expand uh, this equation in this top frame. I mean, you can expand both sides of this equation to relate this colored not polynomials like this PR to these functions F, FR. And for example, you may find that this F for the third symmetric representation, so F with the label S3, can be expressed in terms of colored complete polynomials like uh, here in this bottom frame. And uh, now you can appreciate this statement about integrality because uh, this statement essentially is such that if you take this colored polynomials and make this combination, which is on the right hand side of this equation, then you should get something which has the structure given in this bottom frame. So in particular, something Who's, which has just the denominator q minus q inverse. So now in this consideration, so I'm using in fact a bit different normalization. I also didn't type that in all details, but I'm using the normalization where these complete polynomials in fact are not just polynomials, but they have certain denominators. So it is quite a non-trivial statement that this combination reduces to something whose denominator is just q minus q inverse. And moreover, there are the coefficients are integer numbers. So as you see in this bottom frame, I have some coefficients which are like one third. But despite that, this all this expression reduces something which can just integer coefficients. So this is quite an non-trivial prediction of uh, of Aguri Wafa or uh, also Labastide and Marignon. And people spend some time uh, considering that in, in also in past years. And now also you see that uh, this generating function, which I mentioned in the uh, in the top of this slide, in principle involves all representations. But again, I may focus just on V, which is one by one matrix. So let me call it by X in that. And in that case, as I already mentioned before, this generating function reduces just to the sum over symmetric representations. And in that case, instead of this exponential form from the top frame, I mean, I can replace this exponential form by the product form. It's uh, for this V being one by one, it reduces to relatively simple uh, product form which is given in the bottom of this slide. And then this integer, this integral BPS invariance n with appropriate indices appear in the exponent of, uh, of this bracket that you see. So again, a lot of activity, which is also one motivation for the work I, I have been doing and trying to discuss now has to do with either finding this ends explicitly or proving that they are indeed integer. So this is not quite obvious that they are integer. And okay, so now I introduce this integer 
invariants. And let me stress that they are also related to A polynomials, which is somehow, of course, understandable because this color Jones polynomials are themselves related to A polynomials. And this BPS invariants are some reformulations of PR. So after all, this integer invariant should be related to A polynomials. So let me make it a bit more precise. And to make it a bit more precise, uh, uh, let me first note that if I have this A polynomial equation, so A of X and Y being zero, I can solve it for Y, which gives me Y as, uh, as a series in X. And then the same series can be obtained as the Q equal one limit of this operator y hat acting on p of x and then divided by p of x. So this y hat, let me now remind you, acts by multiplying this argument x by, by q. So I can take this limit uh, directly. I mean, I need to consider this p with argument qx divided by p of x. So let me now uh, take this product form of this expression for p of x. Now this p of x is again this generating function of called complete polynomials, which I had in the bottom of this previous slide. And if I have this product form, this is quite simple to consider this ratio p of qx divided by p of x, because in this ratio I have just this different terms. Well these brackets with different arguments. So in some of them, I have just to shift X by Q and then I can cancel most of the terms between numerator and denominator. And I am left just with these things, with this product on the right in this first frame here. And now instead of this exponents N, I have the exponents which I, which I call by B and these Bs are certain combinations of Ns. So, they are uh, quite uh, simple in a way. So, sorry for the silly question, but why is the limit not one? Excuse me, why? PQX over X when Q goes to one, why is that not one? Why is it mm -hmm. not one? Yeah, P of X over P of X. Uh, Well, the way I take the limit is that I, you have to be a bit careful here because at first I multiply these arguments of uh, in this infinite product. This is probably, it has to do with the fact that I have uh, infinite product here. So maybe this is the subtlety. Because if you look at this thing, it is bottom, in this right bottom corner here. What I do is I, multiply all x's by q and then so this is like with uh, if you have just uh, like uh, infinite cupoch hammer x comma q <coughs> with index infinite this is a series which is like one minus x and then one minus qx and so on if I multiply x by q, then I will get something which starts with one minus qx, but maybe it's hard to. I guess the answer is that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 answer, the, John, the answer is that p, p has q in its definition. So it's actually not just the limit of the argument. Uh, p is oh, there's other dependence on q. There, there is other dependence on q. Oh, that's, right. <clears throat> no. that, that, that's the reason. Yeah, I, I should maybe have been more, uh, more uh, explicit. But p itself depends on x and independently it depends on q. So yeah, so that's why. But uh, in any case, it says that uh, it's not continuous in q to the one. I mean, whatever dependence it is on Q, right? Well, there is some non-trivial dependence. That's the statement. Yeah, it, but, but it's the same in the numerator and the denominator. Yeah, on this, uh, yeah, this other dependence on Q is the same. 
but dependence on x in one case is just x and uh, in the other is just yeah, okay so so if they are thought of as functions of q obviously they cannot be continuous at q equal to one because you get another limit uh, okay yeah. friends so actually piotr so it's time to conclusion for for a conclusion okay. I, i'm afraid yes that's right and then yeah, so you can I... discuss it later yeah, they, that, that's right. So the, let me just maybe show you the, indeed, uh, the, the, this is a good moment to, to stop. So uh, let me conclude for today with, with, these, with these remarks given in the bottom of this slide. So, or even before I go to, <laughs> to, to these remarks, the, the, the statement which is in this first frame is quite important because it tells you that this y of x, which you may obtain from solving the same polynomial equation, knows something about this integer invariance. Because these n's are itself integer, then their combination, the sum over different n's, which gives b's, is also integer. So first of all, this is quite a non-trivial statement that in this way, this y, which uh, comes from the same polynomial equation, encodes integer invariance. So that's one conclusion. And this is also one motivation for studying the say polynomials and the relation to this BPS invariance. And then, uh, as you see, this classical curve A of x, y encodes just this so-called classical LMOV invariance. So these combinations of ends. But if you would like to get ends themselves, you should consider the full quantum A polynomial. So this is yet another motivation for studying this quantum A polynomials. And then this question why they are reconstructed by Topological recursion uh, uh, gives uh, also uh, gets also uh, important motivation. And uh, related question in that context is, uh, I think the answer is not quite understood as well. But uh, how does the topological recursion know about this integrality which appears here? So if we let's say believe that topological reconstruct uh, topological recursion should reconstruct this a hat uh, polynomials then uh, this integrality issue should be somehow important factor. So I think this is an important question to understand it better. So I think this is the mo a good moment to stop for today, because of course it's, well, not of course, but this is not the end of what I wanted to present, but indeed we don't have much time today. So if you don't mind, I might continue at some point. The question yes, is- we, we we eager to see, especially this last part, the this quiver correspondence also. Yes, so the question is, I mean, I am afraid I cannot continue next week because I'm just leaving for a few days. Uh, I asked people about uh, some options about for the next week's seminar. So then I, I will collect them and then I correspond to people. So let me first thank thanks Piotr. I probably stop recording and then uh, the video. I'm sorry, I missed the, the very, very beginning of your talk. So I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I, 